Greetings, everybody. This should be part three of the wedding at Cana. This should be the last one. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries, in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Turn your King James to John chapter 2. I guess we'll start in verse 1. There's a lot of meaning here. Um, I'm sorry, I was thinking about making this one long study, but uh, decided, you know, break it up into smaller sections. And I know it kind of ruins the continuity when you split them days apart. So, but uh, it is what it is. It's nice to have a nice, quiet house to be able to do Bible studies. So, here we go. John chapter 2, verse 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. So I'm guessing this is a pretty decently large affair. I've done a lot of weddings and I'll tell you it's it's hard to not invite people to a wedding. You know, everybody you invite somebody and then they want to bring somebody, you know, girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife, whatever, you know. And it's hard to invite somebody you know that's a brother and then not invite their sister and, you know, so. Verse 3. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. What's he talking about here? <laughs> this is a reference to the uh, crucifixion and the Last Supper. You know, the, the Last Supper and the crucifixion and the New Testament, the New Covenant, believe it or not. And I think I'm going to be able to prove my point by the time I get done with this. Verse 5. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. When he tells you to do something, do it. Um, I'm guessing that his mother, well, that Mary, is either a very close friend of whoever's getting married or possibly a relative or something and some kind of authority. Verse 6. And there were set there. All right, so in verse 6, and there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins a piece. So you got six water pots containing two or three firkins a piece. Mm, gee, Chaplain Bob, what's a firkin? Well, for those of you in the U.S., one firkin is about 10 gallons. And for those of you in the European Union, about 40 liters. So you can figure each one of these six water pots held a minimum of 20 gallons or 80 liters. Some of them maybe had three liters. From what I understand, uh, four firkins is a barrel. And I think a barrel was, what, 55 gallons? 40... 
uh, something like that. About 45 gallons, I guess you could say. It's actually, it's, it's between 10 to 11 gallons or 40 to 45 liters. So <laughs> you got to figure, that's a lot of, that's a lot of water to, you know. So six water pots of stone containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water, and they fill them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. So they filled him up with water. He says, all right, well, now, you know, pour, pour, some, pour some of this stuff into the glass and serve it out. Verse 9. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. Uh, I mentioned in the last uh, part two that some people claim that this is Jesus' wedding. It doesn't say the bridegroom was Jesus. No. It says he called the bridegroom. Doesn't We don't know who he is, but it wasn't Jesus, evidently. Even though some people say this is Christ's wedding. I don't think so. So the governor calls the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. Isn't that the way it always is? You know, you when you have a party, you put out the good stuff, and then everybody's after they've had a few drinks and they're getting drunk. Then you bring out the garbage, the, you know, the not so good. The rot gut. And I've had Baptists try to tell me, oh no, this was not wine. Jesus didn't make this wine. I mean, come on. You're going to tell me that they, this is grape juice? Nobody, nobody over, I mean, nobody under the age of 12 drinks grape juice at a wedding. I've been to hundreds of weddings. Nobody drinks grape juice at a wedding. And besides, uh, what are you going to say? Oh, uh, you put out the good Welch's grape juice at the beginning, but you know, I mean, uh, you know, you put out the Bluebird grape juice at the beginning, and then later on you put out the Welch's, you know, the good quality stuff. No, 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 no. It's wine. You know, that's the problem with uh, what I call denominational doctrines. You know, let the Bible explain the Bible. So, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. So, they brought out the uh, eight-year-old Johnny Walker. No relation. And then after everybody had been drinking, they brought out the 12-year-old Johnny Walker. That's scotch, people. Verse 11. This beginning of miracles, this beginning of miracles, did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. So, evidently, this is the beginning of miracles. I don't know if it was his very first, but it was among the first if it wasn't the first. The beginning. And imagine what the servants that uh, put the water in and it turned it into wine, what they were thinking. And if only Catholics would uh, pay attention to what Mary said when she says, Whatsoever Jesus saith unto you, do it. 
whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Verse 5. Now, we talked about in previous the first marriage, which was probably Adam and Eve. But what about, is there another wedding? Yeah, how about the marriage supper of the Lamb? Now, how is this tied into the marriage supper of the Lamb? Well, <laughs> you got a miracle. You got water. And it's turned into wine. Right? Hmm. How does that work? Well, let's take a look. Now, I talked about, uh, I don't remember if it was part one or part two, about the different baptisms. When a child is born, when a woman's water breaks, you could consider that a type of baptism. When you come to believe Christ, people get baptized in water. Then John told everybody that Jesus would baptize them with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And then everybody is going to be baptized with fire. Everybody is going to be baptized with fire. Not everybody's going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. But everybody's going to be baptized with fire. Believers are going to be baptized with fire and their worldly works are going to be burned up. And then the wicked are going to be baptized with fire in the lake of fire. Oh, yeah. All right, let's do a quick refresher. Matthew 3 and verse 11. John the Baptist says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. See, repentance is being sorrowful for your sin and turning away from it. Water baptism is just like basically a bath, cleansing your flesh. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Huh. Baptism of the Holy Ghost and with fire. Well, what was the uh, baptism of the Holy Ghost? Now, in the book of John, chapter 14, and verse 26, Jesus says, But the Comforter, you know, Comfort, Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he, oh, the Holy Ghost is called a he, not an it. Oh, uh, yeah, there is two places in the King James where the Holy Spirit is called an it, or the Holy Ghost. I forget if it's Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, which is the same thing. But it's called an it. Well, guess what? Jesus is called a holy thing by Gabriel when he was talking to Mary. You know, Bible says uh, if a man finds a, a good wife, he's found a good thing. You know, something good. You know, I don't know. Don't, you know, don't, uh, people love to argue over little petty little points. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, 
whatsoever I have said unto you. Ah, okay. All right, in Acts chapter 1, Jesus speaking, verse 8, But ye shall receive power, power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And then you can read in Acts 2. Well, we're just going to skip around. Verse Acts 2, 4. This is Pentecost. This is Pentecost. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues, languages, as the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Maybe we should, well, let's go back to verse 1. Acts 2, 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Didn't know they made Hondas back then, did you? And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing, mighty wind. Remember in uh, Genesis, I think it was chapter 2, God breathed into Adam the breath of life, and he became a living soul after he gave him a body? Well, this word for wind... Uh, is the word pneuma. Perhaps you've heard of pneumatic tools. Uh, wind. It also means spirit. So, yeah, if you go to a tire place and you hear them uh, putting tires on, those are air tools. And they're a lot safer than uh, using electric tools uh, when you got water laying around. So, and they call them pneumatic tools, air tools. Comes from the Greek. Oh, but Chaplain Bob, the New Testament was written in Hebrew, and then it was mistranslated by those heathen satanic Greeks that were anti-Semitic. Uh, I don't think so. You know, that's the kind of garbage you hear coming out of the pulpits today. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, Whoa, fire. We're going to read some more about fire. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. Now remember Jesus, when the Holy Spirit came upon him, when he got baptized by John in the River Jordan, the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove. But these guys are getting cloven tongues. And then what happens? They, After they're filled with the Spirit, they go out in the street and they start preaching the gospel in different languages. And everybody could understand what they were saying because they were speaking in their language. And they want you to think they were talking gibberish, but they weren't. They were speaking in a language that everybody could understand. So, Verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. And when this was noise abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? You know, Galileans, they were like, uh, well, in America, 
they always will tell you that uh, the, the media will say, oh, yeah, well, you know, if, if you're from the South, you're uneducated. You know, you got to come from New York or New Jersey. Uh, you know, our, our schools are the best. You know, that's what they'll tell you. Oh, you're a bunch of idiots that believe in the Bible and go to churches. You know, they, they try to make you think the Southerners are a bunch of uneducated fools. Well, that's what the Galileans, you know, they, uh, Jerusalem was where all the education was. You know, the Galileans were, pff, oh, they were fishermen. You know, you, you don't have fishermen's university that teaches languages. Verse 8, and how hear we every man in his own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia. You know, I mean, you know, go to verse 11. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. You know, they were speaking all the different languages. Remember the Tower of Babel? Babel. God confounded the languages. Well, here it is. They're, they're preaching to everybody in their own language. So, all right. So what's the deal with fire? The cloven tongues of fire. Well, let's go to Corinthians 1 and verse 3. And yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1. Paul. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Carnal has reference to the flesh, world. Instead of learning about spiritual heavenly things, they're worldly they're carnal they're fleshly why because they're babes in christ they're not mature adults they're babies verse 2 i have fed you with milk and not with meat why because they weren't weaned you know they're still sucking at the breast they're babies need to be fed with a bottle they're not ready for steak. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions. Are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul. And another, I am of Apollos. Are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. Paul says, I have planted. Apollos watered. But God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Now, when they're talking about husbandry, uh, that's what they used to call the uh, master of the vineyard. You know, the farmer, the great farmer, I guess you could say. They used to call that a husbandman. Husbandry. So, we are God's plants. You're God's husbandry. You're God's building. Verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me 
as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. You know, foundation is very important. If the foundation is unstable, like you build it on sand, and then you put a lot of weight on it, and if it sinks or shifts, well, the building will fall down. So you got to have a foundation is very important. I mean, the whole building is important, but a foundation is very important. I even worked construction for a couple of years. I, I wasn't very good at it. I was basically a laborer, you know, carrying stuff around, getting stuff for the carpenters. But, uh, you know, he says, I have laid the foundation, Paul, and another buildeth thereupon, thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the foundation. And if you got another foundation, you got a problem. Verse 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. What day? The day of the Lord. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by, wait for it, fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Every, and the fire shall try or test every man's work of what sort it is. Every man's work. Every woman's work. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. There's going to be a lot of people that are going to have their works going to be burned up and they're going to suffer loss. But Paul says, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Remember, John the Baptist said, uh, be baptized by the Holy Ghost and, by, and with fire. Here you go. Verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. Yeah, when it comes to uh, things like evolution, I want to be a fool. Verse 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Vain means worthless. The thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos, or Cephas, Cephas is Peter, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours, and ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. All right, so let's 
so we've covered um, well we're going to cover a little bit about water I think I got a whole study on water but I'm not sure uh, wait till you get to be in your 60s and uh, have 1500 Bible studies uh, see if you can remember them all let's go to John 4 now I do have a study on this the the Samaritan woman at the well this is a good study I uh, you know John chapter 4 verse 1 when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples see the disciples of Jesus were baptizing people unto with water unto repentance just like John did verse 3 he Jesus he left Judea and departed again into Galilee and he must needs go through Samaria now remember Samaria was the capital of northern Israel Jerusalem was the capital of Judah. Boy, you don't hear that modern demon nominational churches, do you? Absolutely not. They want you to think that a few million you know who's living in the Middle East, that's all of Israel. It's funny, there were millions, millions. And then they're going to tell you that, uh, I mean, you know, a couple thousand years, thousands, you know, several thousand years ago, there were millions of them. And now there's just a handful, a few handful of millions now, 12 to 15 million. God said uh, Abraham's seed would be like the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. Demon nominational preaching turns God into a liar. Which is why I don't uh, go to church. Well, you don't go to church. Where two or three gathered together, you are the church. You don't go to church. You can go to a business that's masquerading as a church. That has a charter from the government. A tax exemption. Oh yeah, and it that's that business even has an, the uh, the name church in it, First Baptist Church of uh, any town USA. Yeah, with a Masonic uh, pastor. All right, so verse four, and he must needs go through Samaria, then cometh he to a city of Samaria which is called Sychar near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Now remember, Jacob was, uh, had his name changed by the Lord to Israel. Jacob had 12 sons, 12 tribes of Israel, right? Right. Verse 6. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Then cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, Now remember, in Jeremiah 3.8, God divorced Israel, but not Judah. And then in Jeremiah 31.31, 31, God declared that he would make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. But uh, the Hebrew Roots people, they don't want the new covenant. They want the they want to redo the old covenant, you know, the, the one that didn't work the first time because sinful human flesh cannot keep God's law. 
just doesn't happen. So, now I want the new, t the new covenant. Verse 9. So Jesus is asking this woman for a drink. Verse 9. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Yeah, you people are still under the covenant. God divorced us. You know, the Jews don't have any dealings with us. We were divorced. Verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Huh. So, if this woman knew who he was and says, Hey, uh, Jesus, would you give me some living water? You know? Verse 11. The woman saith to him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. You know, you don't have a bucket. And the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Listen to this carefully. Verse 12. She's asking Jesus, Art thou greater than our father Jacob? Art thou greater than our father Jacob? Jacob was Israel, people. This woman was an Israelite. Jeremiah 3.8 Divorced Israel, but she was an Israelite. Art thou greater than our father Jacob? Boy, you'll never hear that preached in... Uh, John Hagee's church. Oh, no, she's a Gentile. She's, she's not Israel. She's just a Gentile. She's a non-Jew. You know? Uh, no, she is an Israelite. But they were divorced. They were without the covenant. But then, this Jesus is the fulfillment of Jeremiah 31, 31. The new covenant. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Living water, people. Living water. All right, I'm just going to kind of skip around here because I don't want to make this a... Well, there might even be a part four. I'm not even getting to where I need to go. Let's go to John chapter 7 and verse 37. John seven thirty-seven. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst... Let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly, out of his belly, keep that in mind, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Keep that in mind, his belly. Verse 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, 
because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So he said this before the day of Pentecost. Keep that in mind. All right, let's go to the book of 1 John chapter 5. And I guess we're going to read verse 1 on. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Which commandments? Well, Jesus said the two commandments. Love the Lord and love thy neighbor. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. And your Seventh-day Adventists will be more than happy to tell you that this means, oh, you got to keep the Sabbath. You got to keep the Sabbath. You know, uh, Ellen White, she went to heaven and she saw the glowing Ten Commandments and that the, the Sabbath was just glowing and burned into her brain, you know, and then she came back to earth and says, oh, God wants us to keep that Sabbath. Well, that's not what uh, that's not what the apostles taught. You know? Yeah, it's not about, you know, I usually spend, that's what I do on the Sabbath, is Bible studies, generally. But, uh, you know, do we, uh, are we saved by keeping the Sabbath? No, we're saved by believing in Christ. The two commandments, love the Lord and love thy neighbor. On these hang all the law and the prophets. Boy, I've beat that to death in uh, many, 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 many Bible studies. Verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Listen carefully. Verse 6. This is he that came by water. This is he that came by water and blood. Water and blood. Keep that in mind. Water and blood. Even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. The Holy Spirit, right? For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And if you listen to the people that push the modern Bibles, they'll say, well, this is wrong. This doesn't belong in the Bible. It's not in the original manuscripts and the oldest, best manuscripts. It's not there. It was added by those King James people. Uh, you know, really. May they get their reward by fire. Maybe the lake of fire. I don't know. That's for God to uh, sort out. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. The Holy Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Keep that in mind. The water and the blood. Water is, you know, we've talked about baptism, right? And then the blood, the blood of Christ. You know, the modern Bibles delete the word, the blood, a lot. The Bible records that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. What does remission mean? 
You ever had some heard somebody say, well, he had cancer, but it's in remission now. It means it's not, uh, he doesn't have a problem with it anymore. I don't know if it means it's cured, the cancer that is. And our sin nature is a cancer. But the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. I read that somewhere. Yeah. And there are three that bear witness in earth. The Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. Well, there's millions of them over in the Middle East. Because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Uh, somebody send John Hagee a memo, please. Well, he doesn't believe it anyway, so. Now, remember they were talking about water and blood. Water and blood. Well, what happened at Christ's crucifixion? John chapter 19. Christ has been crucified. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. Remember, there was three on the cro uh, crosses. So the soldiers broke the legs of the first and the other which was crucified with Christ. Because it was some kind of a holy day. I think it was Passover. Yeah, Passover. And they didn't want to leave him up on the cross. And if your legs were broken, uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't breathe. So you would die of suffocation. Verse 33. John 19, 33. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already uh, he was dead already, they break not his legs. Listen to this carefully. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. Now. When people die before what they call rigor mortis sets in, your heart is pumping the blood. And the blood is mostly water. But when the heart quits pumping the blood, the water and the blood will start to separate. Think about it. What did uh, Jesus say would come out of his belly? Rivers of living water? Think about it. Where did they pierce him? His side, by his belly. And forthwith came there out blood and water. By his death, we are made alive, in spiritually speaking. So his side was his belly. Out of his belly cometh living waters. Think about it. So there came out blood and water. Uh, I hate to even go off on a tangent here, but... Uh, there's people that will tell you that, well, Jesus really wasn't dead. He had just passed out from, you know, being beaten and exhaustion and blah, blah, blah. 
And the so soldier here, you know, pierced him his side. I mean, here it is. You've got a soldier who's probably been in many, many battles. He knows full well what a dead person looks like. And sticks a sword, I mean, a, a spear in his side. And the water and the blood are separated, which means death. But they got a thing called what they call the swoon theory. And Jesus really wasn't dead, but he had just passed out. And then they took him down from the cross. And then they stuck him in the, um, the, uh, the grave, the sepulcher. And then after a couple days, he, he revived and got a good night's sleep. And then he came out and everybody says, oh, Christ is risen from the dead. Uh, and that's the kind of garbage they teach in uh, some Bible colleges. Yeah, so you get a uh, spear stuck in your side. You'd been nailed to a cross. You'd been beaten to a pulp. And then he revives after a couple days, and he's as good as new. Yeah. Yeah, that's the kind of nonsense that uh, they teach. They call that, like I say, the swoon theory. All right, so let's take a look at water while we're still looking at water. Uh, before we go to blood. Uh, let's see. Let's go to the book of Revelation. Verse 7, 17. For the Lamb, which is Christ, Christ is the Lamb of God, when he died, but when he returns, he's not coming back as a lamb. Uh-uh, he's coming back as a lion. Big difference between a lamb and a lion. For the lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of water, of waters, living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Hmm. All right, let's go to Revelation 21, verse 6. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Revelation 22, verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life. Water of life. Clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Revelation twenty two seventeen, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. All right, let's take a look at blood. Now, Jeremiah 31, 31, chapter 31, verse 31, talks about the new covenant, not a renewed covenant. Sorry, Hebrew roots people. You want to keep that Old Testament laws? Uh, you go for it. You go for it. I'll just rather believe in Jesus, and that's a whole lot easier than... Uh, keeping some 600 and something laws. And uh, they can keep those Noahide laws if they want. And uh, where are those Noahide laws? Uh, Noahide laws exist only in the minds of rabbis because they're not in the Bible. Yeah, so... What about blood? Matthew 26, verse 26. Matthew 26, 26. And as they were eating, well, this is the Last Supper, people, before the crucifixion, before Christ is betrayed uh, and the, the fake trial and being crucified. This is it. 
And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. Now remember, we were talking about the wedding in Cana, where he turned the water into wine. The water into wine. You know, you, you have a woman uh, water break when somebody's born. You have a baptism of water. And you have a baptism of the Holy Spirit and a baptism of fire. So you got the water. Well, now we're going to take a look at wine and blood. And remember, out of his belly came water and blood, blood and water. Yeah. And there's, you know, a bunch of shepherds on a hill didn't write all this stuff. Nobody could have put this together the way it's just knit together like a, like a phenomenal coat. It just fits perfectly. Take, eat, this is my body. The bread, the bread of life. Verse 27. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The wine. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Ah, when is that? The marriage supper of the Lamb. You see, the wedding in Cana had reference to the upcoming marriage supper of the Lamb. And when Jesus told Mary, Woman, what have I to do with thee? My time is not yet. Well, his time is now come. His time is now come for him to die for the sins of his people. Let's take a look at Luke 22, verse 14. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Oh yeah, he's going to suffer, all right. For I say unto you, I will not eat, I, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Are you starting to understand why Christ turned the water into wine at the wedding of Cana? There's a connection here. I hope I'm doing a good job of explaining this. Uh, it seems like I'm, it's like spaghetti, you know, it just... Uh, all the pieces go all over the place, but uh, I'm trying to be consistent, but I don't know. All right, let's go to John chapter 6. I love, I love this chapter. This is a great chapter. Words of Christ in red, John 6, 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. 
verse 48, Jesus saying, speaking, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And the you-know-whos will say, oh, Christians are a bunch of cannibals. Well, not really. Not at all. Verse 52. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Verse 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. What? We got to be cannibals and vampires? Uh, no. No, no, no. Verse 54. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is an hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? Now ascend up. Jesus is going to go back up to heaven where he was before. Verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. Um, there are some people teaching now that if you uh, get the, uh, the shot, you know, the, the thing that they're pushing left and right, uh, will it change your genes? I think so, but they're saying that uh, it'll change you and then you, you're unsavable. I don't know if I believe that. I mean, if you know ahead of time, it's. I, I would tell everybody, no, 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 no. Not a good idea. But the flesh profiteth nothing. God doesn't want to save your flesh. He wants to save your spirit and soul. That's what he wants to save. You know, if somebody does get the shot and then come to hear the gospel of Christ, are, can they not be saved because they took the shot? I, I don't believe that. And I don't think it's the mark yet. I think they're getting us ready for the mark. But do I think this is actually the mark? Eh, I don't know. The man of sin's not here. The beast isn't here. So I tend to think it's not. But, and I'm not saying to take it. I, absolutely, I'm not saying that at all. But I, I just, you know, I, I think it's a good idea to avoid uh, the devil's kid's poison. But uh, does it make you unredeemable? If somebody takes it, should we not share the gospel with them? I think we should. I'm not an evangelist. I'm a teacher. There's a big difference. I try to take babies and turn them into soldiers. 
And those of you that are evangelists, it's your job to take somebody and turn them into a babe. And then after a while, hopefully they come listen to a, a teacher and become a soldier. You know, we don't need babies. We need soldiers. There's very few soldiers nowadays. Verse 63, Jesus speaking, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believe not and who should betray him. And he saith, and he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man, that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. You want to know why I believe in election? This verse. This is one of the reasons why I believe in election. I really do. Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Listen to this. You know 666? 666, the mark of the beast, 666. Let's read John chapter 6, verse 66. John 6, 66. Now remember, Jesus is just now telling everybody, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. John 6, 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. <laughs> John 666. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Oh boy. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Jesus Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. See, Judas Iscariot was a devil from the beginning. All right, so what about blood? Acts 20, 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. And I hope I'm doing that. I hope I'm feeding the church of God. So, all right, Romans 5, 9, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from math, wrath through him. 1 Corinthians 10, 16, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the blood? body of Christ? And the answer is, yes, of course. 1 Corinthians 11, 25. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. The wine. The water, the remember the wedding at Cana, he turned the water into wine. The baptism into the New Testament, the New Covenant. The difference between a testament and a covenant, a testament doesn't go into effect until the 
person that made the testament is dead. You ever heard of a last will and testament? Well, that's what it is. When the person dies, it goes into effect. Whereas a covenant is like a contract. You do this, I'll do that. You sell me the car, I'll make payments to you every month. But a testament is different because it doesn't come into being until the person dies. And who died? Christ on the cross. That's why they call it the New Testament, the New Covenant. Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. You want grace or do you want law? The Hebrew roots people, they want law. Let them have their law and their Yeshua, who some say is Rabbi Schneerson. Ephesians 2.13, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, divorced Israel, anybody? Jeremiah 3.8, are made nigh, close, by the blood of Christ. How about Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. You wonder why the modern Bibles delete the word blood? I mean, they're taking Christ's death as nothing. That's why the Hebrew Roots people want to go back, go back to law. Because the blood of Christ means nothing to them. And then the sacred namers, they don't even like the name Jesus who Gabriel, from God, the angel Gabriel, probably one of the two archangels, I think Gabriel and Michael are the two archangels, I think. I know Michael is. I'm not sure about Gabriel. But Gabriel gave Christ his name. And those that use Yeshua are denying that. I just don't get it. You want to get a real education on blood. Read the book of Leviticus and then read Hebrews chapter 9. How about 9 7? But into the second went un, uh, but into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of of the people. Skip to 914. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? I mean, read Hebrews 9. The blood of Christ, important. Very important. How about 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2? Elect. Uh, you know what happens to an, in an election? Somebody gets chosen. Well, with God's elect, God makes a choice. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. I forget if it was in part one or part two of the wedding series. Um, that's why I mentioned, I believe we existed in some form prior to having bodies. So the Lord knew where we stood toward him before we were even born. That's just something I believe. I think we existed prior to to the fall of Satan. And some people probably sided with Satan and maybe others didn't. I don't know. 
I mean, if that is true, God wiped our memories of those events. But there isn't, you know, there isn't a lot to go on with that. So that's just my pet theory. I could be wrong, but it would explain why some people are chosen and others aren't. First Peter 1, 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. You want grace or do you want law? Let's skip down to verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ as as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. 1 John 1, 7 and verse 7. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light, Christ is the light of the world, right? But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Wow. How about 1 John 5, 6? Well, we read this earlier, but I'm going to read it again. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness because... The Spirit is truth. Let's skip to verse 8. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. Revelation 1 and verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, Unto him that loved us and washed us, washed us. Isn't that what a baptism is? Basically washing the flesh. And washed us from our sins in his own blood. Hmm. Yeah. So... Let's go to Revelation chapter 7. All right, Revelation 7, we're going to start in verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, white robes, and palms in their hands. Now remember, people, this is all the people from the beginning of the world who were saved. That's why it's called a great multitude. I just don't think there's going to be a lot of them from the time that I lived. But uh, in times past, you know, how many millions? I don't know. And they were clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God saying, Amen, blessing and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? So who are these that are dressed in white robes? And where did they come from? You know, uh, when I took law in um, college, I took business law, we actually had an attorney as a teacher. And I remember this. I think it was a he. I had a woman and a male. I took a few classes in law. But uh, 
They said, you know, an attorney, whether a defense attorney or a prosecuting attorney, will never ask a question that they do not already know the answer for. This way, if the person lies, you nail them. You nail them to the cross. Oh, yeah. Well, not exactly, but yeah. So the elders asking, you know, who are these that are dressed in white robes? Where do they come from? Verse 14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. What are you asking me for? You know the answer to that question. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Ah. There you go. Why white robes? A covering for our sin. And they were made white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more bread of life, neither thirst any more, living water, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. They don't need the sun. They got the light of the world. Oh, yeah. All right, let's go to Revelation 12 and verse 7. Boy, I've, I've read this chapter a couple of times. And there was, past tense, was. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. That old serpent, yeah, the serpent in the garden, you know, that talking snake hanging from the apple tree. What do you think it's telling you, the old serpent? The Bible tells you who the serpent is. You really think Eve was talking to a snake? Really? You know? These people don't even, people that teach this garbage don't even deserve to be teaching children's Bible, Sunday school to kindergartners. No, wasn't a talking snake. It was a figure of speech. And then I've had people say, oh, the dragon and the devil and Satan are two different beings. No, they're not. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. And that probably includes me too. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuseth them before our God day and night the prosecuting attorney satan the devil but we got a we got a defense attorney his name's jesus and guess what god the father is the judge how would you like the judge's son for your defense attorney uh yeah be like Perry Mason. You never lose a case, right? Boy, if you remember Perry Mason, you're old. Well, reruns. Anyway, so. Verse 11. And they overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Somebody tell that to the pre-trib rapture crowd. And they loved not their lives unto the death. And I did an entire Bible study on Revelation 12, 
where I nail that pre-trib rapture lie to the pit of hell where it belongs. You know, the wedding at Cana, when Jesus turned the water into wine, was a foreshadow of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Think about it. Let's go to Revelation 19, verse 1. Wow, this has ended up, instead of being a part four, I'm just going to finish it up here. Make this a long one. I'd like to think this is one of the better studies I've done, but... Revelation 19, verse 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. Now, who are these four and twenty elders? Um, my guess would be the twelve uh, tribes of Israel and the twelve apostles. Paul, not Judas Iscariot. Uh, just my guess. You know, I could be wrong, but hey, wouldn't be the first time. Um, that's why it's handy to have a wife around. She can remind you of all the mistakes that you've made. They're very good at that. I don't even have to remember all the mistakes I've made. I've never mind. I don't want to go there. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. A voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. For the marriage of the Lamb is come. Remember Christ said he wouldn't drink of the fruit of the vine until he drank it new in the kingdom? He said that at the Last Supper, remember? Well, here you go. Here you go. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Verse 8. Oh, and you know what? The bride is not ready. The bride is absolutely not ready. Everybody thinks uh, the uh, when Christ returns, it's it's a rescue mission. No, I don't think so. When the bride has made herself ready, that's when Christ will come. But right now, she's not ready. You know, when people have to choose between Christ and death, they'll know. They'll know. But the wife, the bride, the church, she's not ready. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. The marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Well, that sounds racist, huh? White. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Not our righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. And he saith unto me, Write, 
Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Did you know the words of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy? Oh, yeah. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture his clothing, and on his thighs a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. Oof. That ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth, and their armies, Trump's space force, anyone? And I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth, and their armies, gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse, and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. Ah. See, the beast is going to have a false prophet that's going to be able to do miracles. And he's probably going to call himself Elijah. That's my guess. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast. And them that worshipped his image, these both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Oh yeah, they're baptized with fire. There's two different kinds of baptisms of fire, but uh, they get a baptism of fire too. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, horse which sword proceedeth out of his mouth and all the fowls were filled with their flesh the fowls were filled with their flesh see the king james just flows all right let's close this out revelation 21 verse 1 and i saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea and if you read the book of Peter, um, the heavens and the earth are burned up. Yeah, they have a baptism of fire too. Uh, maybe I should prove that. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. And there's going to be, and people that hate Paul will tell you 2 Peter is 
uh, a bogus book. It doesn't belong in the Bible. But uh, I think they're bogus, not Peter. Second Peter 3, verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. You know, it's funny. The Bible says to work six days, and then the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest. And according to some scholars' calculations, the genealogies and what have you, the earth is about 6,000 years old. Is the thousand-year reign of Christ the seventh day, the Sabbath of rest? That's what I think. So a day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Satan's going to be bound for a thousand years. The Sabbath day? Probably. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, the earth also, also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Good question. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, Wherein the heavens being on fire, the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. All right, let's go back to Revelation 21, verse 1. Revelation 21, 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. You know, it's funny, uh, the uh, those that will deny that Jerusalem, modern day Jerusalem, is going to be Mystery Babylon, they'll uh, quote and say, "Well, you know, Jerusalem's going to last forever." Uh, yeah, Jerusalem will last forever, but it's not going to be the old Jerusalem. It's going to be the new Jerusalem, because the old one is full of filth and sin. And wickedness, and God's going to burn it up. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. 
I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. You see, people, the marriage in Cana, where God where Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, turned the water into wine was a foreshadow of his story of what's going to come. I hope that I tied everything together. I know it's a lot of different doctrines to go through. You know, you got the water, the blood, baptism, the marriage supper, the whole thing I hope I did a decent job of explaining things so all right well this is the end of part three the end of the marriage the wedding of the lamb and the church and the church is the bride period and people say, oh, well, that's Israel. Well, yeah. Galatians 3.29. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Israel's the church and the church is Israel. I, I, you know, it's not that hard to figure out. I'm sorry. I don't believe the Antichrists that hate Jesus are God's chosen people. But, hey, that's just my opinion. What can I tell you? So... And you know what? If the churchgoers, so-called, they don't want to read their Bibles and want to trust a pastor that's probably uh, a member of the Masonic Lodge, let them go for it. Lazy people anyways. I went to one church, so-called, and the guy closed out his sermon early because, ooh, it's Super Bowl Sunday. I want all the guys to be able to go and be able to watch the show, you know, the Super Bowl. I'm like, what? Really? Of course, he was one of them anyways. So that was uh, almost, that was around 20 years ago. Back when I was uh, still halfway trusting the devils. So don't have that problem anymore. All right. Well, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and his only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' precious name, amen.